New MAPS program announcement, MAPS resistance. This is the perfect way to get started. So if you found our podcast, you're like, I want to get started with a workout, I want to lose weight, I want to get in shape, MAPS resistance is the program to get going with. And I'm giving that away for free right now to one of you lucky viewers. Here's what else I'm going to give away for free. Our intuitive nutrition guide to help you with your diet. Two eBooks written by Jason Phillips, our good friend, very smart guy. Macros explained, macros applied. That will also help you with nutrition and free access to our private forum for a year so you can get the support you need because you're getting started on your fitness journey. By the way, MAPS Resistance includes three different types of workouts, body weight and bands, dumbbells only, and barbells and dumbbells. So you can get all of that for free, but you got to win the contest. Here's how you enter. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. If we pick your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get all that stuff. Now, everybody else, check this out. If you bought all that stuff separately, it would cost you 320 bucks. Here's what we're doing for the launch of MAPS Resistance. You get all of that, all the eBooks, the Intuitive Nutrition Guide, the Forum, plus MAPS Resistance and the three workout programs within there for 77 bucks. Huge discount. So normally it would cost 320 bucks, 77 bucks. That's it. But you got to do this. You have to go to mapsresistance.com and then use this code for that discount. Resist20. That's resist20 with no space for that discount. All right, here comes the show. I was looking at the the qua post, right? So on our Instagram, all the questions uh, that people want us to answer. And one of them I thought was really good. I think it was one of the most uh, more popular ones that people liked, which we normally try and answer those when, when they're liked the most, right? But instead of answering it in a qua, I thought it would be better if we did a single topic because I just think there's there's too much uh, to, to, to talk about in related in relation to this, which is you know the mistakes that we made early on as trainers. Yeah, and, and um, there's yeah, quite I think, a few of those. Yeah, I think five minutes is not enough yeah. time. Truth, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Truth be told, we, narr into we narrowed it down to ten because it's, it's <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> way too and that's a lot. It's yeah, too yeah. All, all, I mean, uh, I mean, again, all joking aside, you know, when when. I, I know I'll speak for myself when I start off as a trainer. I mean, I loved it, right? I love fitness. I love helping people. I loved being in the gym, but I just didn't know what I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And I had an idea of how I was going to help people through fitness. And a lot of what I thought turned out to be totally wrong. And it took me a lot. Here's a, here's the sad part. It took me a long time to figure out a lot of the stuff. I would say that I probably wasn't that great for the first at least few years I was a trainer. I say five. Yeah, if not five, right? <clears throat> I ended up training people for, or you know, directly or indirectly through owning gyms for over two decades. So that first, you know, quarter of the time I was a trainer, I made a whole lot of mistakes. And what what drove me to realize those mistakes, I think, is similar to what you guys say, which is mm -hmm. you really want to help people. At some point, you look at everything you've done for the last three, four years, and you go, wait a minute. This isn't working. Well, it's not like our heart wasn't in the right place. So I'll give us a little bit of uh, grace. But yes, if you look back and everything we talk about now because of all these years of practice and, and application and seeing how these these methods play out amongst your clients, it's cringeworthy to come back and see what you're actually promoting uh, when you're first getting started, especially those first few years. Well, I, I, you know, the thing that I like about this episode is you know, when you look at the list that we have written down, at first glance, it actually doesn't look that bad. I mean, some of the things that we're going to go over. Uh, well, you uh, see this a lot still happening. That, exactly. And that's why I think this is a good episode. That's why I thought it was a great question because there's a lot of things that – to your point, Justin, that we were doing uh, with with pure intentions. I, that, I mean, my goal was to be a good trainer. It was in my best interest, right, to to do that. Uh, I just think that looking back now, I think they were they were. I was terrible at it because I, to your point, Sal, I didn't know that I didn't know. Yeah, you know, it, I was unaware. It resulted in people. And by the way, this is valuable for trainers. This is also and probably even more valuable for people thinking of hiring. Yeah, a definitely. coach or a trainer because. If they're if they're doing this stuff to you, then you know that they're making mistakes and they may not be the best trainer for you. Um, so these are things to look out for. And of course, if you're a coach or a trainer, um, pay attention because we're going to explain why they were mistakes. Yeah. Now the first one, this was a big one for me, which was uh, you know I just thought people were lazy. I thought that's why <laughs> they're not getting good results because you know what it is. And here's where it came from. Where it came from was I knew the formula. Right. Okay. You want to lose thirty yeah, pounds for yourself, or you want to be fit. People. Right. You just follow the steps. Yeah. And if you follow the steps, then you'll get the results. 
And, and the reason why this was a mistake was because I completely was unaware of human behavior. Mm -hmm. And I was completely unaware that somebody would not be fanatical about fitness and nutrition like I was, right? Mm -hmm. So I didn't consider any of that stuff. All I thought was, hey, you came to me with this goal. Mm -hmm. Just do what I tell you. Oh, you don't do what I tell you? Yeah. I've it's, done this a million times. It's easy. What's your problem? Yeah, and, and and what it did is it took the responsibility off of me. So for instead of me looking at myself and going, why isn't this working? I would just say, oh, it's not working because they're just not it's being... It's not only that. I think that at this point, at least in my career, I didn't understand uh, metabolic adaptation. I didn't understand how that works. Mm -hmm. So I assumed... You know, these people were lying to me or lazy. You know, either they were lazy or they were lying to me when I, when I would look and assess their results after, say, you know, four or five weeks of working with me and we weren't any closer to their goal of losing 30 pounds. And they're telling me, yes, I did all these things. And I'm like, one, you're either lying and lazy, lazy uh, or lying or lazy. Uh, but that's because I didn't understand that, you know, this person could have. Uh, had mm -hmm. severe metabolic damage because they had been in this crazy diet yep, yep. Uh, for years and years and years and lots of compounding stress. I didn't understand because once you train a, enough people, or I should say, uh, you know, a handful or so of, of similar body types, similar goals, uh, the mistake that I think you make as a trainer is you kind of assume that, oh, you, you've, I've got it figured out. Like, oh, right. I, I trained a client that needed to lose weight yeah, before. Just work harder. Yeah, exactly. Work harder, do these things, and and we should be fine. But, you know, this this was uh, the beginning of my realization of how how individualized every case was yeah. no matter and, how similar the goal made and be. how ineffective i was being yeah uh, I, like this you know when this really hit me when i kept thinking this and i would have the same problems arise client after client right oh they get results but then they can't stick to it or for some reason it's not maintainable they can't sustain it and i'm like oh they're lazy oh this next one oh it's just because they're lazy and so on and then i looked and i said wait a minute among my clients, and there's a bit of a bias, right? People who tend to hire trainers tend to have more expendable income, tend to be more successful, and so on. I looked at my roster of clients and I said, lawyers, executives, medical professionals, these are not lazy people. They're all accomplished in their lives and what they do. Maybe it's my approach. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe it has nothing to do with them not being lazy. Maybe they're just not fanatical about fitness, which I took for granted with myself. And I said, okay, my approach is probably wrong. It's not a laziness issue. There's, it's a lot more complicated. And that's really the answer. The answer is it's much more complicated than that. It's not as simple as that. Well, and the, the crazy part about this one is it, it, it plays right into the second one, <laughs> which is that I train people too hard. Oh, my God. Oh <laughs> so my God. This was first, the biggest mistake. Yeah, you dude. first make the first mistake and thinking, oh, these people must be lazy <laughs> or lying to you. And your answer to that solution is, all right. When you see me on Tuesday, we're going to burn all that shit off. And yeah. so you just get after them. I, and I remember taking pride. This is embarrassing to say, but yeah. I remember oh. taking pride in clients uh, telling me how sore, how crippling sore they were the day after or how, and this was, this is, again, I'm embarrassed to say, but mm -hmm. I'd have a client finish a workout drenched in sweat. They're barely able to walk out of the gym. And I remember feeling proud that the other trainer saw my client could barely move, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I did a great job, right? I just beat the crap out of them. Oh, man. I mean, it's so, it's even hard to admit right now that this is something that I took pride in. Oh, I know. It, it is embarrassing. I mean, I built the reputation originally on like my, how tough my workouts were to accomplish. <laughs> you know, it's like some kind of a badge you earn by training with me. Uh, and to the point where even I feel so bad about this, the lady actually was having just a terrible day and knew that I'm just, I just provide these tough workouts to get through. And she was getting through half of it and broke down, started crying, got emotional. And then I was just at a loss. I didn't know, I didn't think about like adjusting and, and completely changing course to what I had planned. I just kind of waited it out and be like, okay, are we ready? You know, and then just keep <laughs> applying the same thing <laughs> to this poor lady are you who's ready? trying to open up to me. 50 more just, burpees. All right, cool. That's great. But now let's get back after. Yeah. And, and the problem with this is that uh, this is what you learn later on is the right intensity will get them the best results. Too hard gets them there slower or, or results in injury. I mistakenly thought the harder I train them, the faster they're going to get there. So I might as well just train them as hard as I possibly can. Oh yeah. And don't hurt them, but train them super hard. Well, there's a, there's a bit of like a negative loop here too, or like a, a culture in gyms around this. At least uh, this is what I remember is you would walk into like busy time. In the gym that we've talked about before is the five, six, seven PM at night. So at that time, yeah. 
gym's cranking, all the trainers are there. So, you know, if you're at a, a pretty good sized gym, there's 12, 15 trainers moving around and signing clients in and out. And there's a bit of this culture around like who trains their their clients the toughest. And you want to be that guy. And even clients come in like oh, they would they would even exaggerate. Oh man, yeah. you got me today, oh, Adam. Like, off oh yeah. yeah. And then other trainers be like, yeah, I want I want that guy. Like yeah, he yeah. look how look how crushed his client is. You know, and and, and the, oh yeah, then you feel like this. You know, like you said, badge of honor. So there's this kind of this 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 feedback loop that is happening. The clients think they like it. You know, other trainers see it, aspire to be like it and then so people think that this is the way to train people and it's tough to get out of that especially in these big box gyms where that culture's already been established and it wasn't until i got out of that and i saw like small private gyms where you have typically have a a higher class of trainer that's working out there yep, that have yeah. been experienced totally and you see a different vibe going on that was when i kind of went oh wow okay these are some of the better they're trainers they're applying everything i learned and educated myself yeah. through certifications and you know different modalities out there i'm like oh wow you guys actually use this stuff yeah. you know like i would learn it all and then just you know apply the same hammer yeah. to my clients yeah, yeah. you don't want to be the trainer in the gym that everybody says oh he gives easy workouts you want to be the one that's like oh don't train with him ego yeah He's, it's totally and it's so wrong it's so wrong because the right intensity Gets you there faster. In fact, I got interviewed recently, and someone asked me, what are some red flags of a bad trainer? And one of them was this. I said, if they train you so hard that you feel like dying at the end of your workout or you're sort of the touch the following day, that's a bad trainer. Mm. How funny is that? Well, again, it's hard, too. Yeah. I mean, as for most of my career, I was a fitness manager, so I oversaw trainers. And so I got a chance to meet, like, everybody's clients. And I can't tell you guys how many times – I had to have a conversation with a client because they would come to me and say, Hey, I, I want to, I don't want to train with so-and-so anymore because not he's not pushing me enough. Yeah. He's not pushing me enough. Mm -hmm. I want to train. I still, I see, you it know, feeds right into yeah, it. I see what's his name. I see Sal over there and he's just crushing his client. Like I want, That's I want to, I, I, I want to, yeah, I need that. I need that type of motivation. And, and I'd have to talk them out of that. Like, no, trust me, you're with a great trainer. He knows what he's doing or she knows what she's doing. Like, just follow. The but I, I had those conversations all the time because it, it's so in, in, ingrained in the culture in some of these gyms. Totally. Yeah. Now, the next one is uh, is just failing to really individualize workouts or you know, <laughs> I'm so, I'm so training everybody the same, right? <laughs> oh, it's chest day. Here's the exercises we're going to do. Yeah. Oh, and, and the individualization was the weight. Uh, you lift this much weight, you lift that much weight. <sighs> but the workouts look almost identical. I have my favorite exercises, my favorite combinations, and you're just you're not really paying attention to how you can individualize a workout because individualization will make a workout so much more oh, effective. It's this not even just funny. screams beginner. Oh, dude, I'm it's so just, guilty of this. Oh, oh. It's, it's brutal. And I mean, this is something I mean, even brought up in the athletic culture, like this is something that we all experience because everybody trained from the chalkboard, whatever was written up there. Everybody tried to apply it and figure out how best to yep. to accomplish this workout and individualize it for yourself. But it was just the same meat and potato workout every single time, and no customization, no individualization anywhere. No, I'm I'm so guilty of this as an as an early trainer. It's to the point where I even tried to organize my schedule so that I only had to write one workout for the whole day. You know, so I'd, I'd have you know, like nine, a lot easier. Yeah. Nine, 10 people, you know, that see that day and they'd all be on that exact same body part split or whatever like that. So that I didn't have to do it more than once. In you the know what it is? Day. It's because you thought to yourself that your job was just to watch their form and make sure they use the right, right. weight. Not that the exercise made a difference. Not that the technique necessarily made a difference. Not that there was correctional exercise. It was just, Here's the exercises. My job is to make sure you do them right. It's a good point you bring that up because, you know, we're laughing about it. I'm pointing out how terrible of a trainer, but I actually didn't think I was that bad at the time because exactly what yes. you just said. What I did think I was great at was attention to detail and form and yeah. technique, and that's where I thought a lot of my my value was. Was and I was that guy. So you'd see me train these clients. They'd always see them doing the same routine, but I'd be walking around each of them and, yes. and showing yeah. the detail and yeah. correcting their posture and like really getting into it. And so I felt like. I I was really providing tremendous value, even though I really wasn't. Plus, the thing we talked about right before, this also fed into this too, because you'd finally write this routine together that was a ball breaker, and then you would stick with it because you're like, oh, yeah, I got this this hard-ass workout, yeah. and then you wanted to run every client through it to see how they responded to it. And so that, that last problem fed into this one also. Yeah, yeah. totally. Uh, th this next one is 
I was really guilty of, which was just emphasizing these entertainment or entertaining workouts, right? Yeah. The fun factor. Mm -hmm. that, now, the, the, I, the, at some point, this started to backfire because I started to run out of creative shit to do <laughs> with my clients. You know, because, oh, I got yep. Sally coming in. We're going to try that physio ball movement. And, oh, I saw somebody use the battle ropes. We're going to do that. And, oh, there's this resistance band rotational press that we're going to do. And then I'd combine exercises together. And then I'd, it was all about, like, let's make the workout so different that yeah. you're going to show up and be like, wow, this is really fun. And again, the clients also feed into us. By the way, as a trainer, you you want your clients' feedback, but they're not the ones that are driving the workout. And so the mistake I would often make is I would let them drive the workout because they'd say, wow, Sal, I'd never done all those weird exercises. That was so fun. Cool. I'm going to keep doing yeah. weird stuff. Well, the thing is there's sort of a benefit and there's definitely a negative to this because the negative is that it, it deters you. It takes you off of the past the path that's going to lead you to results, which is really what the client came in there in the yes. first place uh, to receive. And, you know, the benefit to it is it is fun. It's engaging. You know, it's something that like, you know, they can talk about and look forward to like the next wacky thing that you're going to have them do uh, in the gym. And also on the trainer side, it's like, you're trying out all these random tools and techniques. And I guess if I'm looking back, it was, it was awful. in, in that, like some of the clients that I was taking through a lot of these like tools and devices and things I was experimenting with, they were literally part of my experiment yeah. and uh, I hadn't really figured it out yet. And so I was able to weed through all that stuff <laughs> and find out what was actually effective and what wasn't. Uh, but uh, in, in terms of like being as effective as a trainer as possible, I was definitely not there yet. Well, when we talk about things like this, it always brings me back to how we all came together because this really is, uh, the first initial, I mean, if Sal would have never sent over uh, MAPS Anabolic to me, the first the rendition of it that um, Doug and him created, and if I would have never seen that, and I wouldn't have been at this point in my career where I'd have, I've learned from this mistake, I probably would have never appreciated the programming as much as I did. I mean, that part of the beauty that I saw in it was the simplicity of that. This is what m like most of my clients should have been training like, mm. even though I went through this long phase of, always doing all these weird creative exercises that were way less effective. And I think a part of that is this insecurity as a trainer that you feel every time they come in, I got to teach them something new. Yeah, they've mm -hmm. already seen a squat. Right, right. They've yeah. already seen that kind of a tricep exercise. So I got to teach them a different boring. tricep exercise. So like I'm constantly feeling like I need to be showing them something that they, they haven't seen before or else they're not going to re-sign with me because if I keep doing the same, you know, great exercises, you know, that they're not going to need me. Yeah, they're not going to need me. They, I need to be showing them something they, they don't know how to do or they've never done before. They don't know why we're doing it mm -hmm. so that I can explain it and I can teach it. And if I kept doing that, then they'd wonder like, oh, wow, if I stay with this guy, I wonder what next week will be. He'll show me something new. Yeah. And so that was my thought. Pro that was that was the extent of my programming in my early years was literally like a around that, like how creative and unique and different can I keep it going in a program so that people always feel like there's something new. Again, I think there there was good intentions behind it. I think the idea, I was I thought I was providing a better service that way, but the truth is, to your point, Justin, they're showing up to get results. Like they they sign up, they at the end of the day, whether they like you or don't like you, they, they're You're there. They're there to do a good job. That's right, yeah. yeah. I, wa I, want, I want to either lose fat or I want to build muscle or I want to be healthier. Like that's what they're paying you for. And there are exercises that are better than extra, other exercises. That's a fact. Yep. And, and long term, especially. Right. Yeah, a hallmark of this is the is the trainer that follows the next fad. Like like I'll, I'll, like I could call, I could go over them. Like I remember when instability training was a thing. All of a mm -hmm. sudden, the fad followers did instability training. Then Tybo, right? Kickboxing game. And all of a sudden, trainers are doing kick these no, with no kickboxing experience, uh, yeah. holding pads oh, yeah. and doing kickboxing, right? Oh, the battle ropes. Here's battle all the ropes. trainers doing the battle ropes. And, Suspension you know, training. Yeah. Oh, circuit train. Oh, now it's all circuit. Oh, hit training. Oh, now everybody's doing hit training. And it's that entertainment factor that is uh, it's a problem. By the way, you're, my, okay, when I became better with my programming and it became more simple and individualized and not so weird, my clients, stay, by the way, they stay with me longer. In fact, all of these mistakes we're talking about actually made me a less uh, successful trainer. As much as I thought that they were helping me, it actually hurt me because later on when I figured these out, clients stayed with me much longer, had better longevity, and sustained the results uh, much longer. This next one was, this one I was so guilty of, and this is mainly because I, you know, if, you know, doing the whole motivation, inspiration thing for me came very natural. I love it. I love talking to people, hyping them up. 
And so this was what I, this was my strength. My mm. strength was to emphasize motivation and inspiration. Oh boy, I could talk anybody into <laughs> working out more. I could talk right. anybody into following my meal plan. I could talk anybody into feeling motivated and inspired to get in shape. Now, there's nothing necessarily wrong with motivation and inspiration, but here's the problem. What happens when that feeling goes away? Which it will. It, it doesn't stick around. Motivation's a feeling. It comes and it goes. And if I convince this person to work out with me five days a week because I'm really good at selling them motivation and inspiration, mm -hmm. when it finally does go away, which it will, they're gone. That client is gone. They're not working out anymore because they've relied so much on depending on that motivation factor. Now, trainers that do this a lot, what do they look like? The boot camp trainers. Mm -hmm. The people that yell at people, the hype, the excitement, right? They're relying on it, you know, summoning this feeling or creating this feeling in the client, and that is a well that is very, very shallow, and it runs out of water very quickly, and then you, your clients don't do very well. You know? Yeah, I'm for sure guilty of, <laughs> of this one. And I think part of the reason why is because I liked it. I bought into it. You know, I, I like to be hyped up and motivated. And like you, Sal, it came very natural to me. I mean, fuck, I even remember like – I had like what they called Schaeferisms where I'd have these, <laughs> well, you know, like, if sexy was easy, nobody would be it. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, it's seriously, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoa, I'm so inspired to work out harder. I mean, I totally, everybody have, has the same 24 hours in every yeah, day. Dude, it's up I, to you. Yeah, yeah. I did, you know? man. I definitely, I, uh, I definitely, pain is weakness. I just definitely that fell in this trap. I mean, even to, I would, uh, I would text clients too. Like, uh, obviously when that, because we were before that. Oh, and I used after, to send motivational quotes. Oh yeah. I'd yeah. say, randomly in the day too and they ate it up and they loved it you know and and so you get that feedback as a trainer so you think like yeah. oh man i am killing it i am doing mm -hmm. a great job you know i'd send them around what are you doing right now like get off get off the couch and go do this like yeah. i do stuff like that to get them moving and people do some people like it and they give you that feedback and so i think i'm doing such a great job because they're like man i just so appreciate you if i was being lazy and then you sent that to me <laughs> and i was fired up and then i went and did it and so it you know as a trainer again i think sometimes uh, you 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 mean well with what you're doing, and you but you just don't realize. Yeah. Well, you, I think this also feeds back sort of to the root of it, which is that you think that these people are just lazy, right? Yeah. And and it's like they need for you to constantly hound them about you know showing up, you know, like getting through this like in crazy intense workout. And like it's it's a total uh, domino effect of all the ones preceding this. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I was guilty too of just like trying to make sure like, uh, you know, my clients would come back and so I'd have to text them be like, Hey, we're going to have a great workout. And like, it, you're always like try this constant hype machine, which was exhausting, uh, by the end of the day, trying to do replicate that kind of energy with every single client, like after that. Yep. And man, I just got burnt out trying to be that guy that that felt like well they're not going to come back unless i do this yeah no i'm glad you said that because there's another reason why this is a failing strategy because for you to be the motivation inspiring Such a person good point. you also have to feel motivated and inspired yeah. and you the trainer eventually are, you lose this are battle. also human and you get burnt out yeah you're oh i don't want to do this this oh is actually God. what led me to actually yeah. wanting to leave training um i i was i was at that time so i was only a, like a tr pure trainer only training clients for less than two years and i was ready to be i was done like i was this I was, is what burnt I, you yeah i was yeah. done being a trainer because i took a lot of pride in being this person uh with every client and i was such the hype man for eight to ten hours a day every day and having to be a chameleon for each one and i again thought i was really good at that so i put a lot of extra energy into it and i just remember after a couple of years being like Phew, i'm tired man yeah. i i just want i just want to be me all day and not feel like i have to mold my personality and my and bring out this crazy level of energy when i'm not feeling not feeling it for the day and that part exhausted me and and the, the truth is when that starts to happen whether you realize it or not your your value as a trainer starts to diminish like yes. you you're just not you're not your full full self anymore and eventually it wears on you and then that will be reflected in your programming yeah. and training and, and the real the big detriment to this is that it takes the the spotlight off of what's really important which is learning how to develop the skill of discipline or teach the skill of discipline, yeah. which is a slow step-by-step -step process, but it lasts with you forever because the skill of discipline is with you, whether you're motivated or unmotivated or tired or energetic. And if it's always about motivation, you have developed no skill to deal with the situation when the motivation has gone. Yeah. You feel burnt out. You feel unmotivated. How many times people say that? Oh, I don't work out because I'm unmotivated. Yeah. Well, yeah. If, well, it's a crush. Of course. 
totally. know, it's a crutch that you're providing your client that, that they're so dependent on, on you to summon and rally this feeling, you know, towards uh, any obstacle that comes their way. Like a better trainer knows to, ha- you know, equip them uh, with how to deal with it when it's, when it's rough and let them struggle through that themselves. Yes. So the next one is going to ruffle some feathers because it still happens a lot. It definitely happens a lot still. And it also took, um, this is one of the ones that probably took the longest for me to like <laughs> really uh-huh. come full circle and figure out how to, how to do this better. Right. And so, uh, and that is to, uh, is giving meal plans. Uh, giving meal plans is a, is a terrible, terrible idea. Like literally for client. And, and I know there's trainers listening right now that well, we're going to th- piss they off. They want to fight. P- fight us every time we bring this up. Yeah, because it, you, you get offended by it. That like, oh, that's what you're gonna give. Client. Nobody eats this way. That's the problem. Nobody want, wants to eat this way. Well, that's why, right? We we had yeah. to explain why it's such a, a failing method to write something down. The you are you're not teaching. You're giving the clients the answers to the test first of all. So like you're, you're just, just doing that. You you may get them to pass the test that while they're working with you, but then when they go off on their own, they're not going to have the tools and the resources to figure this out themselves. So the education process when it comes to nutrition, especially the how individualized it is, is so crucial. And figuring out how to teach that process is so much more important than just telling someone the yeah, answer. Yeah, to go a little deeper to yeah. that, you're you're not teaching them how to navigate the real world, yeah. right? Like how do I navigate the real world? How do I navigate vacations? What about going out to dinner with my husband or my wife? Or what about when I don't have my the food that I that I have on my plan with me, right? I it, It's almost like we thought that we could give everybody a pre-contest diet. It's like we're treating everybody like a bodybuilder. Here's your meal plan. Yeah. Like this is what bodybuilders do for 12 weeks before a show. They don't even do this all the time. It's not a effect. And I thought, by the way, I thought with nutrition that this was it. Like, oh- all I got to do is figure out their their calorie here, burn. Here you go. Here's, here's the, the here's, here's the, the solution. Again, going back to the, I thought they were lazy. Oh, you don't follow the meal plan. Well, of course you're not going to lose weight because you're not following. I gave you what to do. Just follow it and prepare and prep your food and package it and bring it with you all the time. It, people don't live that way yeah. unless they're neurotic about it. And this is the other part is I, I confused everybody with with trainers like. What do you mean? Why aren't you neurotic about it? I'm neurotic about it, you know? Yeah. And I remember I had a client once once tell me, yeah, but if I was as neurotic as you were about it, I would be a trainer. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. You know, this is why I chose to do this. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, it's and, it's and I promise you, well, this is what happens when you give someone a meal plan. They'll follow it, get results, they'll go off of it, and they'll lose all the results. Yeah. Well, this is also another one that's hard because uh, a lot of clients want this or demand this, right? Mm-hmm. So... This is a tough one to navigate. Shit, I was just uh, this was earlier the year this year. I was uh, visiting my uh, my uncle and my aunt, uh, my uncle on the side that actually works within the company and some of that. His wife, so obviously she knows what we do and stuff. And uh, I went out and saw her, and you know I hadn't done anything diet wise or talked to her about that stuff in actually years, probably since I was a beginning trainer. And she remembers I wrote her a diet like way back when. And so I'm out there not that long ago, and she says. Um, would you write me a diet? I go, oh, and, and, and now I have a, a much better way of communicating yeah. this, right? Back then I would just, okay, you know, and write write something where it's now I'm like, yeah, you don't really want me to do that. I'm not really going to help you if I do that. She's like, what are you talking about? Last time you did it, it helped me great. This and that. She's so, we're get, we get in this argument back and forth about it. Isn't that it. funny? Last time you did that, it helped me so great. Well, yeah. why are you here now? Right. You know, you know, and that's mm-hmm. such a hard, and I actually lost. I really did. I lost the battle. So I'm, I'm admitting that I, I just wrote her down stuff because she wouldn't let me go unless I did. She's like, listen, and her final thing Thing was like I don't give a shit. I don't want to learn. You know, yeah, if so you don't do I, it, I've I'll... actually gotten that a few times from clients. Yeah, like, yeah, they're just really adamant that like, listen, like, don't give me all this work. Just give me, you know, the few things to focus on yeah. and make my life easier. So that's so. This is the part that you know I understand uh, the trainers that that get caught in the situation. Okay, I'm as as advanced as I am, and I, I have the words to communicate why she just want to do that. I still lost this battle. Um, now, mind you, she's not a paying client that I'm seeing every day. So what it would look like had I lost that battle and then still train, be training her is I would be be working on that as we're talking. You'd be like, wait for the wait for this to fail. And then we have a great learning opportunity. Right. Now this is yes. I and, I, and I would teach her through yeah. uh, sessions. And, 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 that's, so, and that's what you got to remember. We, we are in a service business. Yeah. So there has to be kind of this middle ground of knowing knowing what I know is best for the client, 
also recognizing that they have this this idea or perceived idea of what you know this relationship's supposed to look like and it's my job to convince them sometimes what is best for them and sometimes that means i got to meet them kind of where they're currently at and that means i got to go okay this is what she wants right now. I'm going to give her what she wants, but then I'm going to explain to her as we're training some of that, like, hey, this is the reason why I didn't want to write you a diet. Here's mm -hmm. an example of a day where I actually would have told you to bump your carbs or your calories because we did X, Y, and Z. Or, hey, this is a day where I would have said, you know what, we probably should scale back a little bit because of X, Y, and Z. Yeah. So take those opportunities if you do get put in those positions when you're listening to this and you're like, well, shit, I feel like my client made me do well, that. Well, this is like when I talked to an NCI, it's chess, not checkers. Right. Right? So it's chess. So sometimes you got you to sacrifice sacrifice a few pieces knowing that later you're going to get that checkmate it's like no different than your kid you know you're going out in the cold and like hey don't you want to wear a jacket and they go no i don't want a jacket and so you're like you, i could fight them and force it on or i could go outside and then they'll be like uh it's really cold <laughs> oh that sucks buddy it's cold you should you know maybe you know, we'll get your jacket next time type of deal right <laughs> so it's one of those situations where it's it's chess not checkers but but make no mistake giving meal plans unless you're giving uh, you're training someone pre-contest Mm -hmm. uh, is a, is really a failing strategy because at some point you go off the meal plan and then you know forget about it, which leads to the next one. Say so I I too much emphasis on supplements. Now I blame, of course, I take responsibility for this, but I do blame the first certifications and classes that I took when I became a trainer because some of these courses were funded by the gyms that I worked in, which were you know were partnerships with supplement companies, and when they would teach us how to make meal plans, which talks to the last one. They would teach us how to integrate supplements yep. into the meal plans. With breakfast, they take their multivitamin, yeah, multivitamin and calcium pills, yep. and then you get your protein yep. and creatine, yep. everything. Before your workout, you're branching amino acids, and afterwards, you're branching amino exactly. acids. And then in the evening, you take this, and here's why it's so valuable. And I thought, oh man, the supplements really make a big difference. This is really going to make a, a huge difference with the person. And this is also when I thought it would make a big difference for me. The truth is, Supplements make almost no difference whatsoever. I mean, unless you have an actual nutrient deficiency, in which case it could be life-changing, for the most part, it's not going to do much at all, if anything, except for make you spend a lot of money. Well, in your defense, too, um, and I think this is actually still true. You would know better than me, so correct me if I'm wrong, but probably a majority of uh, the most popular studies that are circulating are around supplements mm. well, because they're because they have a desired outcome of selling something they're funded it's hard to get funding for a lot of of you know fitness related it's also easier to control it's really yeah. hard to do a study on nutrition because they're so observational and people are notoriously terrible at reporting how they eat and then oftentimes you don't look at other behaviors for example Somebody we may look at and you know and find a correlation between I don't know high salt intake and obesity, but it's not the salt. It's probably that they're eating a lot of heavily processed foods and eating a lot of calories. Just like in the in the the fifties or sixties when they showed studies showed that coffee caused cancer, we didn't realize that coffee drinkers smoked a lot too. So we didn't connect those two. Right. But when it comes to a supplement, it's very easy to control. Take this and then that's all we're measuring, and then see what happens. So you see those studies, and the results are often you know, they, they'll have a result and then we'll extrapolate and then we'll, you know, come up with our own conclusion. For example, you know, uh, taking this stimulant causes more fat, you know, any 10% increase in fat oxidation. Oh, this is going to help you burn body fat. Well, if we do a study that actually shows fat loss, we find that it doesn't make a difference whatsoever because at the end of the day, it's about the calories that you eat and all that stuff. All right. So you're right. And a lot of the sub, the studies that we would circulate amongst each other were around, supplements and compounds and yeah. new things and we as fitness fanatics right especially those of us who wanted to build muscle as you know skinny kids we got hammered with all these ads too i was like i thought my supplement knowledge was my most one of my most valuable things like i know how which <laughs> supplement stacks to put people on and <laughs> oh, yeah. it's going to make a big difference and my, of course the gyms love me because i sold so many supplements i just i look at it a little bit different today right like and i think i always talk about like it, this, uh, how much like spendable income that you have because you know, if you got all the extra money and uh, and you like testing out the stuff like that, there's they're they're fun to try to add into. It's not a big deal. But I also go back to what it was like uh, as a, a struggling kid trying to get by and and buying three hundred dollars a month worth of supplements to get by. And what I know now is that that money would have been better spent on having someone prep my meals. 
mm-hmm. you know, that right there, well, you want to talk about someone having success with, with their diet, you know, the money that they're spending on these supplements, thinking they're going to get the competitive edge of 5% more of whatever it is that they're taking it versus, hey, I've got that the same $300. Now I could buy pay for one of those services that delivers the meals to my house and I have macro balanced, perfect. So much more valuable. Way more valuable. Like the, the, the success rate that that client is going to have by investing that money into something like that uh, will trump any great supplement study all day. And I'll take the Pepsi challenge on that all day long. So that's like where my mind has changed over years with supplements. It's not that they're all garbage. Yeah, they have some value. We use a lot of different supplements here and there. But if I had somebody who's like, hey, I've got $300 to spend, supplements does not surpass things like that. They're far better off investing that when we're talking about you know, creating good behaviors around eating. Totally. Now, this next one uh, connected to some of the other ones that we talked about, and that's really just failing to meet people where they were. It was this kind of all or nothing approach. And this is where the motivation aspect came in and the maybe they're lazy you know, thoughts came in. But if somebody came in and hired me or wanted to work out and they told me, you know what, Sal, I'm just getting started. Uh, I want to come in and meet with you once a week, right? I'm already thinking waste of time once a week. Mm -hmm. You got to be in here at least four days a week. And so now I'm going to have this speech and this conversation with you and talk about how you need to make this decision. And are you serious about this? If you're really serious and you got to make the time and fitness is very important. And they would work with me four days a week because I was very convincing. Um, and then they would fail because it was too big of a leap. It was too big of a jump from where they were. I failed to meet them where they were. Now, I'll, I'll tell you guys a story. I've told this before. It just always stands out to me of, of when I started to figure this out. You know, I had somebody who came to me, was referred to, to me by one of my other clients. And this lady literally, literally, the, within the first three minutes of meeting her, she gets referred to me. She comes in. I shake her hand. We start talking. And she goes, I'm only working out once a week. I'm not doing any exercise at home and I'm not changing my diet. So if that doesn't work for you, then I'll, I'll go somewhere else. Now, early trainer Sal would have been like, peace, see you later. I only work with serious people. The wiser version of myself said, no problem. We will make that work. And I think in one day a week, I can do a lot with you, especially compared to what you're doing now, which is nothing. Now, I understood that this was chess, not checkers at this point. And I knew that my odds of showing her something once a week was great because it was more than what she was doing before. And I knew that doing that would probably get her to eventually want to do more on her own. And that's exactly what happened. Over the course of a couple of years, she went from one day a week to two days a week to three days a week to working out on her own. She started watching her sugar intake, increasing her protein intake all on her own. And it was a very sustainable permanent approach versus blowing her out of the water because I don't want to meet her where she was. Well, this is always why I have a bit of a hard time answering this question that always pops up from other trainers is when should I know when to fire my client? (laughs) And I'm like, I think you're asking the wrong question. Yeah. Like, where are you failing? Yeah. Yeah, Where are you not meeting them? Like, how are you not finding a way to get them more engaged and interested in, in, you know, pursuing their, goals a little more uh, intensively. Uh, and I, again, this is back to like my earlier uh, self where I would fail and be like, yeah, you know, I've given them everything. I gave them all the tools. I'm here on time. Like I'm consistent. I'm do. I'm kicking ass. And uh, it, it, I wasn't ever just like turning that around like, oh, well, maybe I am not presenting this in a way that's, that's really resonating with them. Maybe I'm not finding uh, something else that will spark that and, and be like the catalyst to them all of a sudden getting it, you know, because it, it does take a lot of interactions before sometimes that light bulb finally turns on for somebody. Yeah, my my bottom line for this changed a lot. It, originally, it was like, you're going to either work, you have to work out with me at least three days a week. You have to do a lot of my nutrition and my meal plan. You have to, otherwise, I'm not going to work with you. Later on, this is where the line went. You have to not be a jerk because I'm not going to train someone as a jerk, right? Because that's my hour worth you. So if you're an asshole to me, I'm not going to work with you. Yeah. But if you're cool and you show up for whatever we decide on. So if you decide on once a week and you show up, that's it. Because I know in that hour, I'm going to be able to do something that's better than you not coming to see me at all. And that's enough for now. And then I can work from there. If I tell you to kick rocks or peace out, how am I going to help you? I can't do anything. And- is anyone else going to be more successful? I doubt it. So my line totally changed later on. Your ability to do this um, with exercise and with nutrition, I really think is what 
takes you to an elite level as a trainer. Um, and it's, I think I've refined this over years on what does meeting somebody where they're at exactly look like. And what I, what I've learned now is that if I can meet somebody like, and, and sometimes like you think meeting somebody is like uh, where they're at is that they, they admit that they could do two or three times a week. And so you go, okay, well, we're going to train two or three times a week. But if I also recognize that, that person has done nothing for fitness for years or ever in their life, that actually might not necessarily be meeting them where they're at. Yeah, that's, that, that's like their projected. Right. Yeah. That's where they think they can go or they may want to go. What I realize is like this person has done absolutely nothing. So I need to get this person some wins. And that goes both nutritionally and with exercise. So mm -hmm. if you got somebody who is ate like shit for their whole life, never tracked food, never done anything like that, again, putting them on this crazy strict diet. Uh, right out the gates, even if they say they're ready, I'm ready to diet. Mm -hmm. I'll tell me what to do. I'll follow whatever you say. You you have to learn as a coach to like okay, as, be able to pick up on that and and know the type of person that you're talking to and where they really truly are at, and meet them at a place that they can start to see some wins. Because once they start to see some wins, that's a huge and, mm -hmm. and build some momentum, then they get kind of hungry for it. Then they want more, and that's the place you want to be. Versus you starting out the gates where they think they are at currently right now, and it's that's still hard as shit and way and it's fail after fail. And, yeah, after and they're fail. falling short. Oh, I didn't even make. Three times this week, or uh, yeah, I ate two days this week. What you said on the diet, but then I had a bad day on this day. It's like, and so they're failing. Oh, okay, they'll try again next week, and then next week it's and it's kind of oh, I had a good week, but then the next week they fail again. It's like we're 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 still overshooting with this person. Let's pick one or two things in the diet that we're going to focus on. And a lot of times I prefer to add than to take away, so I'm going to try and add one or two things to enhance what they're what they're eating, knowing that we'll start to limit some of the bad choices that they're making. If they're telling me they want to go two to three, they've never done anything, maybe I'm only going to let them start at one and say, hey, let's be consistent with that. I used to do that all the time. Yeah, and yeah. then from there, we can build upon that because guess what? You've done nothing right now for the last 10 years of your life. Us literally just training once a week, you're going to start seeing change. Mm -hmm. Between that and us making a couple different choices nutritionally, I'm going to start to show you results. That's going to be awesome, right? So you, you start to do that and then build on that. Huge, huge difference. You know what helps uh, people understand this is if you think about the times this has happened to you. Like, have you ever like talked to a friend? Let's say they're an expert in you know bow shooting, and you go to them, you're like, you know, I, I'm gonna kind of try it out, and then they throw everything out. Okay, we're gonna do this. You're gonna get, the, and you're like, all right, no, I don't want to do this anymore. It's like way too much, right? Yeah. Or if they're like, yeah, you know, why don't you try it out with me? And see what you think, and you try it out a couple times, and you're like, "Wow, I really like that." And you know, your smart, wise friend is allowing you to kind of fall in love with it rather than blow you out the water. Yep. I've had experiences like you know with that with investments or with uh, spiritual practice or whatever, where I go to somebody and they dump so much stuff on yeah, me, it's and just I'm too like, overwhelming. It's too much. I'm not going to do this, or I try, and then it's not something I can I can stick to. Um, all right, so this next one uh, is you know it's this one is actually more damaging than it sounds because I later realized that this is this was one of the single most effective tools I could have at creating consistency with activity with people and at getting them to get in better health. And that is undervaluing walking. Mm. Anytime I'd ask somebody, what do you do for exercise? If they brought up walking, it was like they said, they might as well have told me they, they lay down on the couch. Like, oh, that doesn't count. <laughs> that's not exercise. That's stupid. You know, if you're not running or you're not lifting or doing something really hard, uh, it's not really a workout. Oh my God, was I totally wrong. First of all, walking is one of the most, today, effective forms of activity anybody can do for a few different reasons. One, it's still an activity that people can do. And I say still because who knows what it's going to be like 30 years from now. Maybe it'll be like Wally, -E where we're all floating around on, on you know hovercrafts or whatever. Oh, but today, the average person who's out of shape and overweight still knows how to walk. Now, they don't know how to run. They forgot how to run at past the age of 10, so we're not going to have them do that. Swimming is going to hurt them because they don't they don't swim very well anymore. Uh, riding a bike, maybe not. But walking, everybody can walk. So number one, it's you can apply it to almost to, to most people. Number two, I don't need to change out of my clothes. I don't need to schedule an appointment. I don't need to get special equipment. Most people can just go for a walk outside. And number three, I would attach it to everyday activities like, hey, can you walk 10 minutes after breakfast, lunch, and dinner? There's 30 minutes of activity right there. And it's so stupid that I completely I, I completely discredited this incredibly powerful tool that later on became one of my most valuable oh, tools that is, I could use. Uh, the same thing. I would I would scoff at somebody that told me that they they walked for exercise. We had a, a park you thing that you would fill out as a trainer, and one of the questions on there was always, 
you know, what are you currently doing for exercise? And a very common one that I would get is people would say, oh, I walk. And I'd be like, oh, no, I meant real exercise yeah. <laughs> when I asked that question, right? Yeah. And the irony of all this is that that's exactly where I start somebody now. And going back to the, the example I just gave with the, the client who says they can come two or three days, but yet I know they haven't done anything. I would probably start them one day of meeting with me lifting, and then I would actually prescribe walking the rest of the time. So I'd say, well, okay, if you can commit to three days of exercise, let's do this. One day a week, you're going to come in, train a full body routine with me, and then two other days a week, I want you to go for a 30 minute yeah, walk. Yeah, exactly. I do the same thing. And that's yep. so I would start them with that. And knowing that this person is so sedentary and not doing anything, that just simply getting them moving like that again is already going to send us in the right direction direction and i know it's not a major commitment level for them yeah. getting them to just go outside and go for a stroll for 30 minutes is really easy to get someone to commit to versus hey get in your car come to the gym take punishment under the weights be sore get over like that that takes a lot more for somebody well it goes back to providing them with small wins and i and i do believe that walking is just one of those fundamental movements that anybody can get up and do if you're able-bodied uh, and so it, it it does provide that bit of spark of momentum and something to build upon. You want to find these opportunities for something that then you can build upon that's not too demanding and it's not something that when you know they come back to to, to train we're going to have to uh sort of medicate and deal with it's it's just something that's going to provide you know excess activity that's good in terms of like the overall body demanding more movement in general yeah well the studies done on walking show tremendous value it's 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 100 a valuable form of activity and it's the one that i recommend aside from the resistance training that i that would take people through it's the form of activity that later on I realized was the most effective thing that I could add to almost anybody. Yep. I didn't do that with any other form of activity, but walking. You can walk with your spouse. You can walk your dog. You can do it for ten minutes three times a day. I could, you know, it's so valuable and it's so stupid that I totally undervalued it uh, completely when I first uh, became a trainer. Now this last one is about the scarcity mindset that uh, a lot of trainers have early on, and I'll explain my my process through that. I didn't really figure out the value of this. Like I understood it. Like, oh, I, you know, I had, you know, read books on, you know, leadership and I had read books on, you know, growing your business. And they talk about don't have a scarcity mindset. But I didn't really get it until I owned my own wellness facility. So I owned a wellness facility. And in that facility, I had somebody who did nutrition and gut testing. I had somebody who did massage therapy, so like correctional massage therapy. I had an acupuncturist in there, right? I had a yoga instructor in there. And then there were trainers and myself, and I would train some clients. Now, because I owned the studio, it was partially in my best interest to bring business to the other people in my studio as well, right? So if I had a client that would you know, talk about pain in their shoulder, I would also think who else in my facility could help this person. And I'd refer them to my massage therapist, or I'd refer them to the person who does nutrition. By the way, these people paid me rent. I didn't get any commission or sales on it. They just, I just knew it was good for them to have their business so they can continue to pay their rent. Now, I also had a little bit of a fear, which was, okay, now my client's spending more money with these other people, which means they may spend less with me, but I own this facility, so this is something that I have to juggle. What ended up happening, I did not anticipate. Mm -hmm. the, cli the clients that saw me and the other people that were really good that I'd refer them to ended up being the most consistent, best customers I ever had. I started to realize that rather than having pretending to have all the answers, and this is where the scarcity mindset comes from, they come to me with a question, I have to have the answer, and God forbid I refer you to someone else because I'm the guy. I'm the person you have to come to. Mm -hmm. Rather than being that, saying, I don't know the answer to that, or I know somebody who can do that better than I can, when I could do that, I became a maven. I became one of the most valuable. It was like I was their fitness ambassador or whatever, the person who could refer them to other people. And it just, it, it was so valuable that it was, it was incredible. I was blind to it before, right? I yeah. thought if I refer people, oh my God, they're going to have less money to spend on me. It was, it was totally false. Oh, I was paranoid uh, in the beginning because uh, I was so fixated on trying to keep and maintain clients and have all the answers for them. And so I'd stress myself out that, oh no, I don't know the answer. Well, <laughs> you know, I'm going to have to go get all this education and I'm going to have to do all these things to make up for that one fact that I don't know, you know, how to 
how to deal with somebody who has this condition or instead of just going, you know, to one of my colleagues at the time and just having them, you know, come in and bringing them into what I was doing to help out. And it took me a long time to learn how to do that properly. And even with other trainers realizing, oh my God, this person literally specializes in getting your body to uh, do well on stage. Like that's just, that is just yeah. not my thing. Uh, and I, I even experimented one time with, with, you know, one of my clients who I was like trying to help them with that. And then later was like, you know what, I, this just isn't my world. And I know somebody who's amazing for this. And so I thought, you know, I was just going to check that off as a loss. Like, okay, I'm going to give you to, you know, to this other trainer who's really qualified in this. And what happened as a result was she ended up, you know, having such a great performance and got, you know, first place. And was so thankful that, you know, I, I kind of referred that she ended up referring some of her family members to me yeah. that would work well with me for their goals and pursuits. And it was just like one of these things, you know, you build good relationships with other trainers in the gym, like people know what your skill set are. It's not it, it's not that competitive, like scarcity. I'm keeping all my clients over here and, and God forbid you steal one from me. So of all the things that we, we covered today, uh, this is actually the only one I didn't struggle with. Uh, and maybe that was just because I was dumber than both you guys. And I had to ask everybody for help. <laughs> so I was forced to uh, give other people, uh, my clients, when I didn't know the answers. I was always forced to uh, learn from others and stand on other people's shoulders. I didn't have, I was young, I was only 20 years old. And really quickly, I was managing a team of people that were more experienced, more educated than I was. And so quickly, I learned that I needed everybody else. So I relied on that uh, really early on. Now, where I did learn more about this or learn that how valuable it was to not have this scarcity mindset was how much success I had because of that in comparison to a lot of trainers, because it's very common. This mm -hmm. is a common thing. Uh, and I think that's because you work in a gym and trainers need clients. The clients are inside the gym. We're all fishing from the same pond. Therefore, if I help you or give you what bait to fish with or give you any sort of advantage, you might catch the fish that I could have caught. And so there's this competitiveness that a lot of trainers. Now, what I found was I didn't know any of that stuff. I'm trying to learn all these things. I had to learn by asking. And I also found that when I gave my knowledge or taught people what I had learned, I got better at those things. So I hacked into that early on that when I when I would teach somebody something that I had just learned, it would it would you learn it again. I do. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and and I forget what the 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 drop off was. I was just actually reading or watching something the other day that talked about like when you hear something like 10 oh, 72 minutes, hours. Yeah, like you lose like 80% of it yeah, within 72 seven. 72 hours, yeah. Yeah, like a dramatic amount. Yeah, I was like, with you. Yeah, most of it you lose within those those first 3 days. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't know if I knew exactly that's how that worked, but I quickly hacked into like, wow, I just learned something really fascinating. Literally, I was giving up that information like minutes later. I would turn right around and teach other trainers what I had just learned, and it would make me better at that. And so it was selfish. It wasn't like, oh, I want to be this great guy who just wants to help everybody. I was like, oh, wow, if I teach this, it makes me even better at it. So I'm going to do that every time I learn anything. I'm going to turn right around and give that knowledge to other people. And and it's just served me in life and in business uh, my entire life. And then you build build relationships and people value that and trust you. And then that compounds. And so I learned this lesson, not because I had the scarcity mindset, because I saw it and I kind of was the opposite of it coming up. And it's a big reason why I was successful. As yeah. A you know, the studies show that the, when you teach something, it's you, you remember it much longer than when, if you just learn it. Yeah. And this is actually a, a strategy that they'll have. And so I had a client who took her, who sent her son to one of those camps. He was struggling kid, delinquent, you know, the whole deal. Was, she caught him smoking pot all the time. So she sent him off to this place and he was struggling and was just not doing well. And so what they did, this was brilliant, is they put him in charge of some of the other campers. Mm. And once he ran the other campers, all of a sudden he assumed this sense of responsibility. He learned yeah. all the stuff because he had to teach it all. And it was yeah, super brilliant. effective. Yeah, back to what you were saying, Adam, in the gym. You know, it's funny. So just owning and managing gyms, I'll tell you right now, for anybody who's listening who does that, it's if you're a trainer in a gym with a lot of successful trainers, you're more likely to get more clients than you are in a gym with a lot of trainers who don't do very well with clients, even though you may think there's potentially more clients in the gym. It doesn't work that way. Mm. The energy, the vibe, the success breeds more business and more clients. So you may think to yourself like, ooh, I don't want to work at that gym. There's 
you know, 10 trainers in there who are full and just, pie, you know, there's nobody left in that gym. No, that's the gym that you'll more likely to get a client because the atmosphere in that gym is conducive to people hiring trainers. You go to a gym where, oh, yeah, all you know, oh, those trainers, nobody's training anybody and they all suck. There's going to be plenty of clients for me to scoop up. It's going to be much harder in that environment. So, that's the irony of the whole thing. So that scarcity mindset actually hurts you in almost every way that you think it saves you, which is the irony of the whole thing. Look, if you like this information, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our guides. We have fitness and health guides that can help you with almost fitness and health goal, with almost any fitness and health goal. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. 